In the previous episode, we installed and tested two custom-built gadgets on our 719cc supercharged intercooled diesel engine in our project car. The purpose of these two gadgets is so we can tune the engine to make more power and so the car can be driven in the big city without rolling coal every time it accelerates. The linear boost controller valve worked perfectly, however we did encounter a problem with the adjustable fuel rack limiting gizmo. Fortunately, a temporary software patch was uploaded to the microcomputer and that allowed us to continue testing and validate the operation of the fuel rack limiter. Today, we're going to modify the fuel rack limiter so we can remove the software patch and allow the limiter to function as designed. Plus, we're going to start adding all the necessary sensors to the engine so the microcomputer can automatically tune the engine for the best performance. Just so we're all on the same page, the engine that we're fooling around with is an old school diesel with mechanical fuel injection. An engine like this one will run as long as it has access to fuel, and this engine doesn't have any electronics nor does it require any electricity to run. You see, once this engine is started, it'll run until all the fuel is exhausted. That's both good and bad. The good news is, this engine's ultra reliable. The bad news is, well, there isn't much we can do to this engine in order to alter the way it runs. Basically, the only two things we can fiddle with in order to optimize the efficiency is the boost and the fuel rack position. Now, with that said, the approach we're going to be taking when it comes to tweaking this engine will be fairly simple. However, we will have to install a number of sensors so our microcomputer will have sufficient information to adjust the boost and how much we can allow the fuel rack to move. So let's talk about the microcomputer and the sensors. To begin with, we're going to be using an Arduino Uno. Now that's an 8-bit microcomputer that runs at 16 MHz. This micro has 14 digital ports and 6 analog ports. The analog channels are connected to a 10-bit analog to digital converter. Now, if this seems like a lot of techno gibberish to you, well, I totally understand. Basically, this microcomputer is not very powerful when it's compared to modern standards, but for our application, it has plenty of computing power. So if you watched our previous videos, well, we've already connected two low-cost stepper motor drivers to our Arduino. These drivers provide a simple solution to interface the Arduino with the stepper motors we're using to control the boost and the rack limiting device. These two controllers use 6 out of the 14 available digital ports. Now on the analog side, we've installed a simple interface that we're using temporarily in order to manually adjust the boost and the rack limiter. This interface will become obsolete once we develop the software that will automatically adjust these two devices. But for now, it's an important aid in the software development. So now we need to add some sensors. Well, the first one will be the throttle position sensor. This one's a little bit tricky, but no worries. We can monitor the position of the accelerator pedal, and that should be good enough. Now I'm thinking we should really know how fast the engine's spinning, so we're going to monitor the RPM with a simple analog tachometer interface. I'll show you what I'm talking about later in the video. The approximate vehicle speed will be handy to know, so we're also going to monitor the vehicle speed with another analog interface. So far we have three sensors, and that'll provide some basic information so the microcomputer can adjust the fuel and we don't have to roll coal every time the car accelerates. The next sensor is going to monitor the exhaust gas temperatures. Now, initially, we want this sensor to keep track of the exhaust gas temperatures, and we'll write a bit of code so the data from this sensor can directly command the fuel rack limiter to push the rack back to a safe limit in the event we exceed the design limits of the engine. You see, right now it's very possible to roach this engine in about a minute if the accelerator is held to the floor too long. Anyway, I feel it would be nice if we didn't destroy this very expensive engine, and to do that, we're going to actively protect it with a computer. And, as a backup, we'll still have the alarm that's built into the Madman multi-gauge. Because, well, never trust a computer. Shall we play a game? Boost pressure is kind of important, but at this stage, I don't think we need to monitor it. You see, there are basically three boost levels that we're interested in. The first is zero boost, then half boost, and then full boost. 
All three of these boost levels can be set by the microcomputer without actually measuring the boost. And this is because the hardware is very predictable and the micro can set these boosts basically with its eyes closed. There's a few more things that we're going to add once we get the basic system operating. For instance, a lot of folks suggested that we add a switch that will alter the software for performance or fuel economy. Yep, that's easy to do, but before we get there, let's go ahead and get the system up and running first. Let's start with the throttle position sensor. Now, to save time, I've already 3D printed everything we're going to need to install this guy. Now, everything we're doing at this stage is experimental, and I'm using these temporary quick connectors. These work great for rapid prototyping electronic circuits, but they're not suitable for long-term automotive use. At some point, I'll replace these with automotive-style connectors. A few weeks ago, we fitted the car with a bell crank on the throttle cable, and that's so we would have easy access to attach our throttle position sensor. As most of you folks know, on a diesel, there's no throttle body on the intake manifold. It's pretty much wide open. Instead, the throttle is this lever here on the injector pump. Well, this is an awkward location with the engine in the car, so we decided to split the throttle cable here because the alternative was to attach something to the accelerator pedal, and that means working underneath the dashboard, and I'm too old for that. Anyway, let's install this guy and see how it works. This car is a rolling experiment, and a lot of the things that I do or build are intended to make life easy. Well, because not only do I have to work on this car, I also have to film everything. The easier I make this car to work on, it really helps with video production. I get a lot of comments from folks who make perfectly reasonable suggestions, but I feel sometimes they forget that this car is just a fun experiment, and I don't actually drive it other than what you see on the videos. Okay, fast forward a few minutes and the throttle position sensor is wired into the microcomputer and I wrote a few lines of code so we can verify that it works. Let's check it out. I've got the serial monitor going so we can read the data that the Arduino is processing. Now for the nerds, the numbers we're seeing are in counts and eventually I'll convert them over to percent of throttle opening. Let's see what happens if I press down on the accelerator pedal. Yeah, it works fine. Right now these are just raw numbers, and I'll incorporate them into the main program once we have all the sensors in place. Well, the throttle position sensor is done. Let's set up a way to measure engine RPM. For that, I'm going to start off by using this Hall Effect proximity sensor, and we'll add a few magnets to the crankshaft pulley. That way we can count the magnets as they pass by this sensor. So this is actually the supercharger pulley, and it's probably the best place to install the magnets. I reckon we could mount the sensor somewhere in this area, but I'm not exactly sure where yet. I think we'll first modify the crank pulley, and then figure out where to mount the sensor. Fast forward a few minutes, and I've placed the jack under the engine, so I can remove all the junk that's in the way. Normally, putting a jack under the oil pan is never a good idea, because it can damage the pan. But, this engine only weighs 150 pounds, and the oil pan is plenty strong. Okay, the crank pulley is off the engine. To make life easy, off camera I 3D printed a template so I can precisely mark the exact location each magnet has to go. In this case, we're going to add three magnets to the pulley, and I'll explain why in a few minutes. So the Hall Effect proximity sensor that we're using can only detect the south pole of a magnet. I reckon it's important that we install these magnets correctly, so to establish the correct orientation, I'm going to check each magnet. So there we go, that's south pole on this magnet. This side will need to face out so the sensor can detect it. I'll go ahead and mark this magnet so we don't lose track of what side faces out. And of course I'll do the same thing for the rest of the magnets. Now to hold the magnets to the pulley, I'm going to use JB Weld to epoxy them in place, and to be sure they don't fall out, I'm also going to stake them in place with a punch. I am sure some of you folks can already smell the JB Weld just by looking at it. It's a familiar scent for sure. What is that smell? Now interfacing this Hall Effect sensor to the Arduino ain't that hard to do, but the software to make it work, well that's where it gets complicated. Generally speaking, the code required to measure frequency is too slowed if you use the standard keywords in the Arduino library. To do it right, you have to use advanced coding, and meh, we ain't doing that. 
You see, the priority of this system is to actively command these stepper motors without any delay when the car is accelerating. Both of these guys will be working overtime and we can't waste any time doing frequency calculations and dealing with interrupts. So we're going to cheat and use this frequency to analog voltage converter. It basically converts digital frequencies into an analog voltage. And at that point, the Arduino can measure the analog voltage and calculate the frequency. It's not precise, but it'll be in the ballpark and that's all we're looking for. Let's do an experiment and see how this thing actually works. Now, this gizmo will generate a 0 to 5 volt signal and its operating range is 0 to 200 hertz. So if you recall, we added three magnets to the crank pulley earlier. The reason we went with three magnets is they'll generate a 200 hertz signal when the engine caps out at 4000 RPM. And that's kind of what we want. Actually, I'm only interested in engine idle speed and anything below 3000 RPM. Now, anything above 3000 RPM is not relevant to the way this system will work. Okay, for this experiment, we have a cheapo frequency generator that's outputting a square wave, and I'll set it up to generate a 100 Hz signal. Since 100 Hz is half the range of this device, we should see 2.5 volts on the voltmeter. And sure enough, 2.5 volts. Let's take a look at what the Arduino is seeing. Well, there's a little bit of math involved this time around, and as you can see, the Arduino is showing a little bit over 2000 RPM, which is a few RPM high, but I'm not complaining. This is fine for what I need for my calculations. Let me adjust the frequency to show 1000 RPM. And, yep, it's still reading a bit high, but that's fine. Now, keep in mind, this doesn't need to be precise. We're only looking for RPM ranges. Also, for the software nerds, this TAC uses three lines of code with no interrupts. It's just an analog read with some math to convert counts into RPM. For this project, there's no need for precision. We're just looking for changes in RPM. So this $8 circuit board simplified the code and it allows the Arduino to focus on controlling these two stepper motors. Now remember, we also have to measure vehicle speed, which is yet another frequency measurement. And for that, we're going to use another cheapo board and do some simple code. These two low cost solutions provide the data that we want without adding complexity to the code. And that's good enough for me. This guy is the actual fuel rack limiter, and in the previous video we discovered it was calibrated incorrectly. You see, this rod that's sticking out is about 2 or 3 millimeters shorter than it needs to be, so we'll likely have to replace the rod with a longer one. The calibration error we discovered, well, it was a simple mistake. Here, let me show you what happened. This chunk of aluminum is the calibration rig that I built, and the gizmo is installed like this. Now, on the other side, we can see that the rod length exactly matches the length of the actual fuel rack limiting screw, which is exactly what I wanted. The problem is, I forgot to include the base plate and the gasket that this fuel rack limiter sits on when it's installed on the engine. So when I add the simulated base plate and the simulated gasket, well, the rod length ends up being quite a bit shorter. Fortunately, we were able to modify the software slightly and command this rod to move a little bit more than it was designed to move. Meh, it worked and I was able to confirm the gizmo could indeed actively limit the movement of the fuel rack. You know, I'm okay with a few things not being precise, but this gizmo really needs to work as designed, so we're going to have to replace the rod with a longer one. Fast forward a few minutes and this guy is apart. Yeah, the grease is normal and that was applied to the rod prior to assembly. Here, let me clean that off. That's better. So the stainless steel shaft is press fitted into this brass coupler and the brass coupler is threaded onto the jack screw in the stepper motor. Just for fun, let me show you how this works with all the stuff removed. Okay, so the first movement, that was the device searching for home position. Once it finds home position, the step counter in the software is zeroed out and then the rod moved to the position that's indicated by the temporary interface. Anyway, if I twist the knob, the rod can move in or out. Now, this is all done with software magic right now, and the commands are coming from the simple interface, but eventually I'll write the core program and everything will be automatic, and the commands to move the rod will be calculated from the data gathered from the various sensors. Okay, fast forward a few minutes, and off camera I disassembled the gizmo and replaced the rod with one that's quite a bit longer. Actually, it's way too long, but no worries. I'll cut it to the proper length once it's reinstalled, and I can determine the exact length it needs to be. 
So here's a quick animation how the system is designed to work. This of course is the automated fuel rack limiter and this is our boost controller valve. Right over here is the original fuel rack limiting screw and this is a simulated fuel rack. This guy can slide back and forth inside the engine. On a normal diesel engine that's made for a car or a truck, this fuel rack is directly connected to the accelerator pedal. But on our engine, that's not the case, and the fuel rack is controlled by the governor. So to get this car from rolling coal when it accelerates, we need to actively limit how much the fuel rack can move. Okay, so when the engine's at idle, we're going to push this rod out a few millimeter. This won't affect the idle, and all it really does is set the fuel rack back to the way the factory calibrated it. Also, the boost controller will be wide open and will be actively venting the boost from the supercharger. Keep in mind, the following events will happen in less than a second, but may take me a lot longer to explain it. Anyway, when the accelerator is pressed, the first thing that happens is the boost controller will close and provide maximum boost. Lean burning diesel engines love boost and this won't hurt a thing. Now the governor will immediately want to shove the fuel rack this way, but for a moment we'll block the fuel rack from moving. Then we'll start retracting the fuel rack limiter and the engine will start feeding on more fuel. This should theoretically eliminate most or all of the smoke we generate when the throttle's first depressed. Anyway, if this acceleration event is normal like in urban traffic, the software will track the engine speed, the vehicle speed, and manipulate both the fuel rack and the boost accordingly. And that means it may actually pull back on the fuel or the boost as the car travels at a moderate pace. Now, in the event the computer sees a full throttle signal from the throttle position sensor, well, at that point, we'll let the engine feed on all the boost and all the fuel it wants. When the captain calls for warp factor 9, well, there's no debate. We just make it happen. Warp 9. Hi, sir. It might be a little bit messy, though. So, unfortunately, I'm still waiting on a few things, and I won't be able to take the car out for a run today. Actually, I won't even be able to start the engine at this point. Now, today's video was a bit of an experiment in itself, and I want to see how much technical crap I can spew from my pie hole and still have an audience. Personally, I love fiddling with electronics, but it's not for everyone, and I get that. I do know that there is a bunch of folks out there that really dig Arduino projects, and this is one of the more unusual ones. But at the same time, it's still a nuts and bolts project. It'll certainly be interesting to see if adding a bit of technology to this car will make the difference I'm looking for. I reckon we'll find out soon enough. Anyway, stay tuned and I'll see you next time. Until then.